Alright, welcome back to another episode of the Chad Townsend Show. Today's episode is brought to you by playersgolfclub.com.au. Head over to the website, the link is in the description below. Check out our merch, accessories, plus our golf day, which is on at Townsville Golf Club on Friday the 13th of October. It's a four-ball Ambrose event. Get your squad ready. There's some amazing prizes to be won. Um, it's going to be a really fun day. We've got a heap of Cowboys players coming. Uh, the coach is coming, the big dog, the sheriff, he's coming as well. So it'll be a uh, fantastic event. You won't want to miss it. Playersgolfclub.com.au. What a weekend we had in week one of the finals. And again, after last week's podcast, uh, we got a lot of love last week. So thanks to everyone who tuned in, listened, watched on YouTube. We really appreciate you guys. Uh, we've decided to do it again, and I've brought back... The sensation, the Triple M sensation, Elliot Lovejoy, mate. Thanks for coming on again today. The words are a lot kinder this week. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, mate, the ratings are in, mate. The people, sure. the people loved it. Yeah. So we're um, we're happy. We're back. We're doing it again. Yeah. But um, mate, how are you? Yeah, really well. Um, obviously high stress environment watching finals football over the weekend, particularly as a Newcastle fan. Sunday afternoon, I think I aged about twelve years in that game, and I will unpack it. I found a few more greys in my beard, but we got through it. We go again. There was plenty that come out of the first weekend of the yep. finals. Um, obviously, we'll speak about your nights later in the episode, but we'll start off um, the podcast with the Broncos Storm game. Yep. Obviously, you know a lot going into the game with regards to the Broncos and their hoodoo against the Storm at Suncorp Stadium. The Broncos came away with a massive, massive win. Um, huge performance by the Broncos, I thought. Uh, there was a lot of standouts, um, but for me, it was probably uh, the captain, Adam Reynolds. I thought yeah. he was outstanding. Two try assists, two line break assists, 372 kick metres. I thought um, he really steered the ship, didn't he? Yeah, and I know you guys always talk about owning big moments and, you know, the best players own the big moments. There was probably two in that game. Uh, there was the dropout uh, where he's managed to find touch, and that obviously wasn't by accident. He's kicked it about 40, 45 on the fly almost and straight to this perfect corner. And then where he had a hand in the tackle of, uh, I think it was Coates in the corner. Uh, and, and I think if Coates scores there, it's a 6-4, potentially 6-6 six, six game. He has a couple of big moments outside of the, the flashy stuff that you thought, well, you know, he's ready for this charge. The thing with me is that... The tackle that you just spoke about with Reynolds, yeah. that has been a common theme with the Broncos all season long. They are, the way that they defend, they have so many numbers going to the corner. You can just tell their defence is on. They're extremely hard to score against. And I think it just speaks of the attitude adjustment that they have changed this season, especially with their mm. defence. Would you agree? Yeah, I would. And, and I know speaking to some of the players there that they said that was their big focus in the preseason is, look, you know our attack's going to be good. Look at the players we've across the back line. It is a, it's a fifteen million dollar team. It's a star-studded attack. But they said, we, you know, we can score thirty points, but if we leak thirty-two, then what's the point? So, yeah, that, keeping a Melbourne team at any stage of the year to zero, incredible. I, I can't remember it happening in the finals besides that Manly game back in oh eight or whenever it was when it was forty nil. It was, yeah, it was an amazing effort. Some of the other standouts from the game, Herbie Farnworth, 163 metres, Pat Carrigan, 193 metres, Payne Haas, 180. I mean, just a, yeah. a cruisy 180 from the big fella. Um, but the thing that I was really pleased about, and, they, and these guys probably haven't got enough credit throughout the season, obviously because of the, the other big names we just mentioned, but their bench was outstanding on the weekend. Kobe Hetherington, 140 metres, mm. and Keenan Palacia, a huge 153 metres. That's huge. Yeah, he's a big pickup for the Titans next year. I think he's flown under the radar a bit, and blokes like him have kept um, Martin Taupau and Corey Jensen out of that seventeen, who were two wonderful players off the bench, and uh, he certainly justified his selection on the weekend. I just think it it can really just it changes your team when you've got two guys on the bench who can come on and run for you know nearly three hundred yeah. metres. What what uh, what a performance by those two. Reese Walsh had one try assist and one try. Had a few errors in the first half, but I thought the second half was was a lot better from him. Yeah, and that's I think anyone that speaks about Reese that watches 
and enjoys his footy says you, he might make a couple of mistakes, but he does about five or six amazing things that always seems to make up for it. Yeah, it was probably by his standards one of his quieter games, which is scary considering the Broncos still won so comfortably. The Broncos controlled 52% of the possession, and for people who are out there and have a look at this stat, usually teams will try and aim for that 50% mark, yeah. which kind of means that you've, well, you've obviously controlled more ball. Um, in our game, if you tackle more than the opposition, more than likely you lose the game. That's yeah. kind of how it works if you make more errors. They completed at 75%, 36 of 48. And on the other hand, the Storm, Elliot, um, in my opinion, were their own worst enemies. They beat themselves, which is kind of rare for the Melbourne Storm. What was your take on the Storm? I, I was just shocked that their attack was so off, and, and you can go into the mechanics around that. Um, I, I really thought when we spoke about it last week, there's no doubt, you know, your Munsters, your Harry Grants, etc., were up for the game. Uh, but for whatever reason, everyone looked out of sync with each other. How this works, and uh, it's it's a combination of a couple of things because you know you speak about out of sync yeah. on the back foot because if you if you don't control the ball, you know we just spoke about you do you do more tackling, which takes out more juice from you. And then when you get the ball, if your forwards and your team are tired from doing all the tackling, you get the ball and then you're forced to get in shape, well, you're just not there. The, team, the, the timing's off because of the fatigue's there. Um, I thought the Storm, from the, the get-go, I thought they were on the back foot. They made a couple of er errors early, mm. that, um, that drop ball early, which put them on the back foot. Um, I mean, you had, I just had to look at the coach's box. Bellyache, he looked like he was blowing a gasket, didn't he? There, there was a great bit of footage, I don't know if you saw it, of a, it was a, a young girl, she would have been, I don't know, maybe 12, 13 years of age, in full Broncos kid in some sort of corporate box next to, to Bellamy. And I reckon it's the first time, A, she's ever uh, seen Bellamy, and B, seen a coach's spray like that within five metres of her, because you see the first glance over, and then she's trying to get the attention of someone else. It was like a kid on Christmas, honestly. To have the pleasure of obviously not having to be around Craig Bellamy, but being able to watch Craig Bellamy have one of his all-time blow-ups, that, you know, that's worth the price of admission alone for her. <laughs> we just spoke about before the Storm beating themselves, which is very, very rare, and yep. something the Storm have prided themselves on for years, I guess, under the whole Craig Bellamy tenure since he's been coaching. They completed at a mere 67%, which was 25 of 37 sets, which is just not going to win you any game, let alone a finals game against the Brisbane Broncos. Um, again, for people who might be looking at that stat and wondering what that means, 67%, um, well, teams will usually aim for around that 80% above mark. Um, that will give you enough chances to be in the game, yep. um, control the ball, and basically have half of the possession, which um, is what you need. Um, Ryan Papenhausen, uh, Elliot, what absolutely devastating. I was watching the game on Friday night on my couch, and yep. uh, he went down, and it you know, straight away I just got to the edge of the seat, and I was just devastated for him. I was really, really upset, um, as a you know, a colleague or a fellow player to see him obviously spent nearly 400, week, 400 days on the sideline to come yep. back and get injured. It was devastating, wasn't it? Yeah, I think purely as a fan of the game, it, it sucked the life out of my lounge room and it sucked the life out of the entirety of Suncorp Stadium, Storm mm. Broncos fans alike. Like you said, I don't reckon there's a person in rugby league as a fan or a player that doesn't like Ryan Pappenhausen and uh, he's one of those, you know, Reese Walsh caliber players in terms of the excitement he brings to the game and bums on seats. And I suppose the good news that came out of it is the initial assessment was compound fracture, which can be career-ending. Yep. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, the Storm have said that they hope he'll be right to go for round one of next year. It's, it's the same injury uh, Jackson Hastings had from a hip drop tackle last year. So it's a, it's a pretty nasty break still in that lower leg, and he'll be feeling the effects of it for a while, but they say he, he should be good to go for round one. So best positive news, I guess, yeah. from a bad situation for, for Papineau's. And let's just quickly touch on the Storm uh, um, forwards. We spoke about before the, the Storm making a lot of errors, which forced them to make more tackles. Yeah. Have a go at this stat. The only Storm forward to run for over 100 metres was Nelson, the big fella off the bench. I suppose that was the concern too, is and and this is a testament to the Storm, their system to to Bellamy is that they've managed to grab players in the past and this season too. Uh, an example, probably Josh King, that uh, at Newcastle was a fringe first grader and turned them into, 
you know, really reliable, regular players. But if they're not at 110% of their capacity, unfortunately against a pack like Brisbane, you're going to get monstered. And, and they did last week. So you would expect a very different Melbourne forward pack this weekend. The Brisbane Broncos now have the luxury of having the week off. Yep. Um, they get another chance to rest and recuperate. Obviously with them having uh, the ability to rest players in the last mm. round as well, um, you just have to think that the Broncos are primed and ready with um, what what's they've been able to achieve this season. Yep. Um, where the Roosters now will travel down to Melbourne uh, and play the Storm. Um, which is what, what's going to be a huge game uh, next weekend. We'll move on to the next game uh, from the week one of the finals. That was the Panthers versus the Warriors. And the Panthers um, quite convincingly beat the Warriors. Um, I thought Nathan Cleary is probably the, one of the most dominant performances I've ever seen. We're, we're talking about halfbacks here, which I love. I love talking about halfbacks. Yeah. We're speaking about Reynolds. Now we're speaking about Cleary. What did you make of Nathan Cleary on the weekend? That, I think everyone's talking about that moment where he loses his shoe uh, in the play. He puts his boot back on. He's in at first receiver. I think it was on the last tackle. They set up shape on the, the right. His boot comes off again. He's got one shoe on, and he throws his pass to Liam Martin, which I think is the best short ball I've seen this year. Uh, and Martin hits a hole like he can that passage of play, I had to rewind it and watch it over and over again. I know the try he scored at the end was incredible too, but that play for me, I was like, oh, like finals Reynolds, finals Cleary is here. Yeah, he was uh, he was unbelievable, I thought, on the weekend. He ran for 194 metres, wow. which is just insane for a halfback. We spoke about before, only one storm forward running for over 100 metres. Yeah. Well, in this game, uh, the complete opposite, Nathan Cleary's run for 194 metres, which is just Insane, and I think with Nathan, he you know, since uh Jerome Luai has been out, um, he's probably taken like he's a quality runner of the ball, he's probably taken on more of a running game without Luai. I mean, the the Panthers, and if you watch closely, will run this play where they come out uh, to the left side, and usually it's Nathan who will turn under. Jerome, and he'll skip back on the other side of the ruck, where now it's Jack Cogger who's dropping under um, Nathan Cleary, and he's the one who's running across and skimming across field. And what the Panthers do, Elliot, is they play a lot of drop plays on the edges to have their guys coming back through the middle, and they'll get the arms tackled or they'll get the quick play the ball, and then they'll play off the back of that. Mm -hmm. So I think props to Nathan. He um, had an outstanding game. There was a couple of others who um, were really impressive on the weekend. I thought the Panthers back five, again, who have been probably the most dominant back five in the last three, four years, haven't they? Yeah, and, and love him or loathe him, Stephen Crichton still reaffirms himself as the best centre currently in the game for me. I just uh, to think that he, it wasn't that long ago he was playing on the wing and he hasn't played centre that long in first grade. What he's able to do on attack, and, and, and you can speak more to what he's like defensively, it seems like his reads defensively, I, I can't remember the last time he got one wrong, to be honest with you. I think with uh, Stephen Crichton at the moment, he's very he's very locked in, he's very yeah. focused. Obviously, he's got the, the big deal at the Bulldogs for the next couple of years. He's yeah. leaving Penrith, which no doubt would have been an extremely tough decision, but one he you know had to make. I think he's really locked in on finishing strong with Penrith and you know, obviously playing him in the last round, seeing his performance on the weekend. Um, you know, I think he's dialed in to just make sure he finishes on a on a positive note. Um, I quickly want to touch on the Panthers again and the way that the style that they play. We just spoke before about them changing angles on the on the on the ruck um, and coming back through the middle. They base their game on the very simplest things in the rugby league game. And that is they run hard. They're very aggressive with their line speed. And it is just so effective. Their completion rates are continually above 80% to, uh, above 80 on the weekend. It was 82%. They controlled 57% possession of the ball, which the Panthers have just choked out teams with the amount of possession they've been able to have. Yeah, I, I I love watching their play the ball speed because I, I, you often when you watch the Panthers, if you can't go with them the first twenty minutes, it looks like it's just it's impossible to get back in the fight after that. I can't remember the last time I watched that Panthers team have a lead and lose it at any stage either. They're just uh, yeah on the weekend they were clinical and, and when you look at 
Penrith and Brisbane, and I mean this with no disrespect to any side from the last 10 to 15 years, if it goes the way it looks like it could go grand final-wise, I think they're the best two grand final teams we've had in 15, almost 20 years. Well, they have probably been the standout two teams of so far throughout the season. With the Warriors... They missed the start, I thought. Yeah. Um, penalty error, and then concede the first try within the first five minutes. The scoreline probably doesn't do justice of, of how the Warriors played. Mm. Um, obviously, last week we recorded the podcast, and I think next day um, Sean was out, yeah. and um, obviously that was really disappointing uh, for Sean. And hopefully, fingers crossed, I think he's been named for this week's game, so he, hopefully he's, he's okay to pl- play. But, you know, we spoke last week on the podcast about Sean having a a different 5'8", number of different 5'8s throughout this season and them coming in and doing their job. But mm. if you take Sean Johnson out of the side, the kicking, the control, the amount of touches, um, the class, yeah. they were probably always going to suffer a fair bit without Sean, weren't they? Yeah, and, and you know, you, you give credit to the guys that were in there. Obviously, Dylan Walker came into the halves and, and they had a crack. But without Sean, Penrith were a class above. But there was still some... Some battles I really liked during that. Um, Adam Fanil Blake and Moses Liotta were going at each other physically and verbally at one stage, and it was like it was like two Godzillas going head to head. It was it was a little bit scary to watch. I, me- <laughs> I remember seeing a, a verbal at one stage they had, and the next collision they had, I, I felt it. Uh, and Fanil Blake, and I think you said this last week. I think because he is playing over in New Zealand, and and you know they get to hide away a little bit from from all the media stuff. Jeez, he's a good footballer, even in a beaten side. I don't know his numbers, but his effort areas and the high minutes he's able to play, he's a freak. He is a freak. And we spoke last week about the, the footwork. Yeah, You see it every week in, week out. And watch him again this weekend because he'll do it again. He'll run extremely hard. He'll put someone, he'll run directly at him. All of a sudden, he's got footwork. He's in between defenders. He's getting his nose through. He's down and up. He's a quick. He's got a quick play of ball. Yeah. The Warriors are off. Wade Egan's going for a run. Um he does play extremely big minutes for a big man. Yeah. It is um, obviously really, really impressive. The Warriors, um, as disappointing it was for them, they do get another chance. Um, they head home uh, to play the Knights, which we will talk about at the back end of the podcast. Um, so let's move on to the next game of the weekend, um, the Sharks versus the Roosters. The Roosters coming away uh, in 13-12 in what was a bit of a clunky game mm. Uh uh, for mine, a very tight game, an exciting game. Um, five errors from both sides within the first 12 minutes of the game. Um, possession very tight, 51% from the Sharks, 49% of the Roosters. Yeah. Completion rates, 73% for the Sharks, 74% from the Roosters. Uh, the Sharks made 15 errors, the Roosters made 12. Um, but still some some really, really good performances. Any Key standouts from you from this game? Obviously, Sam Walker, the field goal. Yeah, I think you could look at a number of different roosters. Billy Smith playing a, a half of the game with a broken jaw. Uh, Hasn't he come along this the back end yeah. of the season? And, and so good. Mm. Yeah. What's he had? Three ACL injuries? Yeah, off the back of a couple of really serious injuries. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's been incredible. I'll, I'll probably look at Nico Hines because I think he's getting whacked, pill at a post from people saying, oh, he can't own big games or big moments. I thought he was Cronulla's best. Definitely, I agree. Yeah, I, I I don't understand that narrative. Now some people say, okay, he needs more help outside him. Fair enough. But people say, oh, he can't own big games. If he's the best player on the field for Cronulla, well, he did. And unfortunately, does that just mean a few blokes maybe didn't go with him? Nico doesn't deserve that. He's yeah. by far um, one of the best players in the competition. I thought he was outstanding on the weekend, and he wasn't the f- the reason as to why the Sharks didn't win. No. You know, the Roosters make a couple of big plays at the back end of the game with, with two, you know, desperate charge downs. And, and let's quickly talk about that because the first one was Tedesco. The second one was Luke Keary, which to me, you know, they're two guys who are the Roosters' leaders just coming up with big plays in the big moments. That's what you expect from those type of guys, don't you? Yeah, and, and I feel it hasn't been talked enough, the moments leading up to, to those two charge downs as well because... What the Roosters lost during that game on the weekend, I don't think many other teams would have been able to continue and win that game. So they lose, uh, they lose Joey Manu, they lose Joseph Suali'i. This is all during the game. Uh, Teddy goes off uh, for a sin bin for ten minutes. They only concede one try during that period. 
there are so many different phases of that game where you've got, I think, Wong, who looks like he's a super talent, had to defend in the centres for a long period too. So many phases of that game, you think, oh, OK, Cronulla are going to run away, and they just didn't quit. Uh, it's a remarkable turnaround for from 14th six or seven weeks ago to making it to the second week of the finals. Their back line this weekend is absolutely decimated, but they're there. Yep, definitely. And you just spoke about Teddy, who spent that 10 minutes in the bin, which was a bit of a silly decision from Teddy. There's no way he was square. Obviously, that's a penalty and a send-off yep. every day of the week, and he probably regrets that. But is, Teddy, that, is that a fatigue decision? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think it's just a bit of desperation. Don't want him to score. Yep. You know, do anything to stop him from scoring. And unfortunately, it... it um, it went the wrong way, but he ran for 210 metres, which, you know, for 70 minutes, 70 minutes <laughs> which was impressive. Um, Cronulla's back five, which has traditionally been really strong, was strong again. I thought mm. Connor Tracy, 171 metres. Um, the back five of Cronulla, uh, one of their biggest strengths. Um, Ramian, Mulatalo, Talakai and Katoa. And they're durable. They play every single game. They're very rarely are they injured. Um, I thought they were they were really solid, but... Let's just go back to Sam Walker, the field goal. Um, what a night for him to, to kick that field goal with, I think, yep. seven minutes to go to put the Roosters in front. Um, he's obviously had a lot that's happened this season, but it's just great to see him back in the side, making plays and winning games for the Roosters. Yeah, it is, and, and smiling and having fun. And, and you, you can speak to field goal mechanics. It looked like, because he had that pressure on him, it, it looked like he, he purposely put a little bit more loft on it, almost as if you would a short... Uh, chip drop shot, out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it was. It was like getting your, your sandwich out or something like that, which I thought was so clever in a moment where you got not much time to think and you got 17 defenders in your face. Yep. I, I thought it was terrific. I think with the, with the drop too, you can yep. see that the ball wasn't straight up. It right. was tilted a little bit back, which um, obviously you got under it. A lot more spin on the ball, a little bit more height. Um, yeah. But execution in a big moment. Yeah. Unbelievable. Deserves um, a lot of credit for, for that play. Obviously, uh, I want to shout out my mate, good mate, uh, Wade Graham, um, who announced his retirement at the back end of the season and mm. is now officially retired. Um, Australia, Origin, won a comp, was a great, great teammate, great captain of mine. Um, so, you know, we wish Wade Graham all the best in his future. What have you made of, of Wade and, and the career he's had? He's been playing... NRL since 2008 when he was in year 12. Yeah, and I think I think the mark of the man too is is the uh, impressions he's left on other people. And uh, I spoke to Tom Hazelton after the Cronulla Cowboys game, and we spoke about Wado, and he said, "Mate, oh, I can't say enough good things about the footy he's still playing, but what he does off the field for us young fellas, he's always there to have a conversation, whether it's on the phone, in person, middle of the night, first thing in the morning, anything like that. And and I think Wade's a clever man. He set himself up nicely at Triple M, so I'm, I'm sure he'll be doing plenty of work with us over the next um, chapter of his life. Yeah, I, I've I've loved watching him play, and I know he's a good mate of yours, as you said. It's uh, yeah, it's been a remarkable career. Yeah, he. Um Obviously made his debut at in the halves at five eight with yeah, the Panthers right, yeah. transition to to the back row. Um, you know my great memories of Wado is just giving him the ball early and him like making plays with his passing game on yeah. an edge. Um, he used to run this play with um, the fullback and the centre and the winger where he could play short, long, uh, long or long to the winger and. I just used to love seeing it. He was yeah. he had skills of a back rower that not many other back rowers had. Obviously, being an ex half, um, like you just mentioned, a great teammate, a great team guy, and um, yeah, we wish him all the best um, in the next phase of his life. Which you said, I think he's going to be on oh, the radio mate. and on Triple M. He's smart. <laughs> him and Woodsy, honestly, they've sorted out their post career very well. Um, <laughs> well, I, I will just quickly on Wado. What was he like? Because uh, that Cronulla team you guys played in, there was some big personalities there and and big egos and I don't mean that in a nasty way we all have egos in our own way but there was some you know big ones there was he a manager of them or was he one of them uh, <laughs> a bit of both yeah I reckon he was definitely a manager yeah. with it all he was all about bringing the team together yeah but if he wanted the ball and he didn't get the ball he would let you know about it yeah. and I remember one day because uh, our left edge and our right edge used to go at it a fair bit. Uh, we had Luke Lewis on the right and Wade on the left, and sometimes those two had to be separated, and they were really, really close mates. But yep. it just kind of showed you, you know, what 
training was like with regards passion. to the, com- the passion, the competitiveness. Mm. Wade had that in spades. He yep. was an ultimate competitor. Um, so he was tensing your question. He was a, yeah, he was a, a bit, bit of both. Bit yeah. of both. Um, all right. We'll move into the last game of week one, uh, which is your Knights mm. uh, beating the Raiders in what was an extra time thriller. Played in front of 29,548 fans. Yep. Um, mate, what did you make of the game? Because what a game. Yeah, I think as a neutral, you call it one of the best elimination finals we've seen in a long time. Um, as a fan of either of the side, you were having heart palpitations the entire time. <laughs> it was it was difficult to watch in patches. Uh, I, I'd Firstly, I'd say Canberra's effort, and we spoke about this last week, Canberra's effort is what we expected. Ricky had them in the sheds prior to the game saying no one gives you a chance, go out there and, and show why you're a finals footy team and fair play to them, they did. I'd, they, I, I actually thought for the most part they were the better team. I know the Knights had that great passage but the, the Raiders forwards probably won that battle. I thought Jack White and played outstanding footy and it's yep. scary to think what he'll do in the centres for South next year and, and, and the Knights I think just having a, probably a little bit of class and you know, blokes like Dom Young that can run away and make something out of nothing, and obviously Kalen Ponga probably helped them. I think Jack Wyden, every time he got the ball, he looked dangerous. Yeah, it was did. just like, I was like, Raiders, just get get it out right and then swing the ball to Jack Wyden, yeah. give him the ball, because every time he had the ball, there was something happening. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the, uh, the end of the game before we talk through it about the um, extra time and not golden point, obviously, as the rules with, with the NRL finals. There's no golden point. Um, first and foremost, there's two five and a halves of yep. extra time. If we're still locked, we go to golden point. Good thing or bad thing? I I, I like it because I, I think it gives you... Like in golden point, a lot of the time we have seen an unlucky moment where a, a team, I'm not saying didn't deserve to win because they got 80 minutes through a game and they, they were tied, but uh, I, I like the idea of uh, just the extra time instead of the golden point because it does allow you, okay, the team that does play the best footy for the next 10 minutes will win this game. I know it was a bit of a, an innocuous penalty that, that ended it, which is a shame because it was such a, 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 a brilliant uh, elimination clash. One thing I'd, I'd probably like is uh, on broadcasts, uh, on, on telly, as a fan, I, I reckon it probably needs to be explained a bit better uh, because yep. there were people watching certain ones that had no idea that was the go. You yep. heard the referee talking a little bit about it, but it wasn't explained necessarily on, on the broadcast itself that, hey, just because you score, the, the game's not over. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think you need to explain them all what's yeah. happening. Yeah, dumb it down for us. Yeah, because then some, some people are just thinking, oh, yeah. why aren't they going for the field goal? Yeah. And Jamal Fogarty's kicking to the corner to yeah. point, try and build pressure. And you're like, um, it's probably just, yeah, dumb it down. Yeah. Put it on the screen potentially. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are a few things uh, for the fans. There's a couple of really good performance. Um, you just spoke about Dom Young again, who I think uh, the Knights will be – Devastated to lose him, won't and you're, <laughs> I can see it in your face already. <laughs> well, the Knights have had some great wingers, right? You go way back to Darren Albert, to Mad Man- Dog, to Manatahu, Mad Dog, uh, Aquila Uate, Dom Young breaks the try scoring record this year, and he does it. And he probably said about five words to anyone who is this quiet, unassuming giant. Uh, and, and the story of if you haven't heard it, how he was found. Alex McKinnon was watching highlights of him on YouTube. Um, got him over to Newcastle. He stayed in Alex McKinnon's granny flat for the first year he was there. Uh, yeah, look, I, I wish him the best. The, the Roosters have actually signed his brother too. Smart business, Chooks. Well done. Mm. Um, so they'll be living together in Randwick. I believe he's single. So, geez, there's going to be some eastern suburbs women just holding <laughs> vigils outside with flowers and lining up. He could be the next bachelor. I'm, I'm so sad to see him go. But, yeah, what a, what a talent. Yeah, what a talent. Uh, 224 metres and then uh, Greg Marju, yep. another insane 222 metres. And we gave Greg um, mm. some praise last week of the season he's had since he's moved from the Titans to the Knights. Yep. Um, Phoenix Crossland again, we spoke about him and what a, what a back end of the year. He's had 62 tackles, which is just mm. insane um, in the 90-minute performance. Uh, some highlights for the Raiders. Jordan Rapana, 280 metres. And we spoke last week about Rapana's ability to get into the ruck and scoot from dummy half and offloads and short sides and things like that. He was... Um, wreaking havoc, I thought. Atta Mariota, mm. 193 metres uh, in the front row for the young front rower um, in place for Papali'i. Um, what did you make of his performance? I, I, think, I thought he was huge. Heard big raps on him and have watched 
moments to him off the bench where I thought he looked great. Jeez, he looks good as a starter. Uh, you're right, he was probably the best forward on the field, which, you know, he's only played a handful of first grade games and they also lost one of their young forwards early in the third or fourth minute so to step up a bit more geez, he's got a bright future he was outstanding definitely agree I think Ricky Stewart's done a really good job this year with the Raiders yeah. Ricky's just ultimately so passionate about his players and yeah. his team in Canberra and the Raiders yeah. um you know, we spoke again about last week, him on the podcast and yep. some of the um, animation he shows yep. towards the media, backing up his players. Um, he deserves some credit for the year they've had and obviously the adversity they've faced. Um, before we move on, I want to touch on quickly the uh, Tyson Gamble, Willie Mason comment was um, yes. pretty interesting. Bit of popcorn there out there. Willie Mason um, said that if you took Ponga out of the um, Knights team, they were the worst spine in the league, which mm. I thought... Um, Gamble responded and took that personal, which I thought he had every right to. Um, do you love it or do you do you leave it? Do you think um, it's good for people to sort of bite back and say what they think and have a bit of personality and show it, or do you think you know we should keep it all Aussie, humble and and all good? No, I, I love it because both of those blokes do the same thing. I, I yeah. like Willie Mason too. Yeah. I, I think the show he does with uh, the scopes outstanding, and Agreed. it's an opinion based yep. show. And you listen to Willie's comments. Uh, I actually don't think – he didn't mean them in an offensive way to the Knights. He was more saying, hey, they've overachieved. Uh, but, you know, Mace has his own turn of phrase. Yep. Uh, and, and Tyson, yeah, he responded. I think he said, uh, you know, you can F off or words to that effect. Uh, we're a bunch of hard workers that do their job. Fair play both sides. And, yep. and I, I don't reckon Mace would have been offended by the comeback from Gamble. He either. probably cheered him on and he probably, it, yeah. I reckon he had a little... Yeah, yeah, you know, he, he yeah. didn't respond on social media anything like that. I saw the scope was having a bit of laugh uh, about it. Uh, it's play on. I, I like both of them, and I think it's good for the game. Yep, I couldn't agree more. I think it's great um, for people to have strong opinion about what's happening um, in the game. It just adds to the rugby league so yep. popular that it is, and it's great to see you know um, Gamble standing up for himself and his yep. teammates. Um, but yeah, fair play to, to both parties. Absolutely. I I enjoyed all of it. Um, mate, let's move on to uh, the the main part of today's podcast, and that is the the preview of the week, uh, the week two games, which is um, going to be some absolute crackers. It's do or die football this weekend. We're going to start off with the Storm versus the Roosters. Um, in Melbourne, mm. uh, we spoke about before the Storm uh, will be losing uh, a lot of players through injury, but that is the same for. Uh, sorry, did I just say the Roosters? The Roosters are losing. The Roosters Elliot, are yeah. losing a lot of players, yeah. but so are the Storm, mm. Elliot. Um, the Storm, obviously, no Pappenhausen, no Coates, no Tony Mapaya. Uh, for the Roosters, no Manu, no Billy Smith, and no Suwali'i. But we're still expecting fireworks, aren't we? Yeah, Justin Ollum coming back in is, is going to take a carcass with him. There will be one of those huge Ollum shots. I absolutely that's paying a dollar one. You don't uh, want to be uh, you don't want to be in front of that. Nah. nah. And, and and it doesn't matter if you're at the opposing centre, prop, hooker, uh, sideline physio. He he will take someone's carcass with him <laughs> at Amy Park this week. That's a promise. Um oh, I think the Roosters are so badly hit with injury. Um I, I tipped him last week, by the way. Just want to go on record. I also tipped Melbourne, though. So, mm. uh, <laughs> um, oh, I can't see their backline competing with with Melbourne's for this one. As much as I'd love to say they could, I'd, I, and I also can't see Melbourne putting two bad performances together. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same. I'm, I'm leaning towards the Storm this week, mm. and it's purely for the fact of how poorly they played last week. Yeah. And the Storm, as we all know, they rarely put two poor performances back to back. Yeah. Uh, I've got no doubt that the the spray and the reaction from Craig Bellamy in the box on the weekend will have its full effect in the video room this mm. week when they do their review. Um, the things they need to fix up, definitely their ball security. But them playing at home is a different prospect. We spoke about, you know, the roosters and the amount of talent they're missing. But um, the cheese. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Smith heads back to Melbourne in what's going to be a, a do or die clash. Um it's a big game, and Cheese is going back to his old his old home, isn't he? Yeah, and they'll be a bit in this one too. <laughs> I, I, and I know they're all mates, uh, but not not on the field. They're not nah, not on the field. It, it will be off the field before the game, after the game. Absolutely, they'll be trying on. to take each other's head off. Oh, 
And um, yeah, there's again some great matchups across the park. Um, Lindsay Collins has just been leading the charge for the Roosters. He'll continue to do it. That that front row of Melbourne has to stand up in this one too. We mentioned before how poor their forward pack were last week. Well, here's an opportunity for him to get back. And and just a kid that's coming through. We mentioned his name before. Um, Sia Wong. Yep. He's playing on an edge from the Roosters. I didn't know much about. Jeez, he's playing good footy and playing good footy in his first season in the finals too. Yep, I thought he was a standout on the weekend. Um, since he's got his opportunity in first grade, he's he hasn't let the team down. And he looks like a real star of the future. But I think, to me, you just mentioned it, this game is going to be won in the forwards. I think, you know, we spoke about the, the injury toll both teams have um, had in their outside backs. Yep. The, um, obviously taking a toll on both sides, which has kind of, I guess, levelled up both teams to an extent. But to me, it's going to be a, ju- a juicy battle in the front row. Lindsay Collins, Christian Welch, um, you know, those guys are the big ones going to be relied on. Fletcher Baker comes into the side up front row for the Roosters as well. Um, Tui Kamikamika uh, will be mm-hmm. partnering Christian Welch. But to me, it's a battle of the forwards. Yeah, it is. And, and, and probably a guy that maybe hasn't got the credit he deserves because I know... I'd, Everyone's the first person to whack him. I thought Victor Radley played the perfect Victor Radley game last week. Controlled aggression. Yep. Ball played really well. I think every tackle he made, it hurt the opposition. Uh, I, I thought he was outstanding. And again, I think people are so quick to whack him. And sometimes, rightly so, he, he's had a few brain snaps on the football field. But it's also probably important that we highlight when he's playing good footy. And he was outstanding. Yep, definitely agree with you. I think that's probably one of the most composed performances we've mm. seen from, from Victor and we know, you know, he can kind of verge on that side of, you know Insanity. Uh, insanity. Yeah. That's on on <laughs> field insanity. Yeah. That's a that's yeah. a good word. Yeah. Um you know, he's a hell of a player, yeah. uh, of Victor. And and Tarek Sims, who I thought made a difference actually on the weekend for the Storm, you know, as bad as they were, he came on and had a good bust um, off the bench. So the Storm will be looking to bounce back. Yeah. Um, they have to improve their ball security and their possession. Um, and we spoke last week of, of their dangers in the Storm side, which they still possess. Obviously, their spine needs to stand up. They'll be disappointed after last week's game, not able to put many points on the board, you know, um, not controlling a lot of the possession, which is not just solely on the spine, but yeah. um, obviously to, to get some tries and some shape, um, yeah, that, that will be they'll be looking towards them, especially Munster. Yeah, I think we'll see um, like Super Saiyan Cam Munster this weekend with the golden <laughs> hair flickering because uh, everything he did last week turned to Kaka, and and he said that he, his kicking game was off, his running game was strange, his passing game was off. W- we won't see that again. This will be. This will be the Cam Munster we know and love this week, and I'd be surprised if he's not the best player on the field. For the Roosters, who do we think the keys are for the Roosters? Obviously, uh, we just spoke about their forwards and Lindsay Collins. Um, you know, Sam Walker and Luke Keary, who I think, if the Roosters are to win on the back of Lindsay mm. Collins and their forwards, and I'm going forward, I think. Um, I think it's Sam Walker. He's the X factor with the, the short pass, yep. the short kick, uh, the long floating pass over the top. He's got it all in his kit bag, and he's going to be someone the Storm have to shut down if they're to win. Yeah, and, and we, we've spoken about the fact that Sam's just playing free, fun footy, you know, like the footy he would have played when he was 13 years of age, just uh, eyes up footy, they call it. So he's been great to watch. I, I actually think the big one for me is... The overachieving Roosters backline needs to overachieve once more because, and you can go through them. There's some guys in there that have not played much first grade at all, or, or this year, and and they have to find a way to take those tough yardage carries and, and do their bit with Billy Smith, Suali'i, and Manu all yep. out. Yep. Look, this is, I, I think the the Roosters with the adversity that they've had, mm. the injuries they've had, yep. like they. they, they an unbelievable. Yep. It's much like the Knights. You know, they won their back end. I think it might have been seven or in a row, yep. something like that, to get into the finals. Yep. Um, they need to go in again, go down to Melbourne in hostile territory, yep. and do it again. And they've shown over the last month or so yep. that, that they're up for it. So who's who's your pick? I, I got to go Melbourne. I just I, again, I look at. Um, you got Momorowski coming in for the Roosters, who's played maybe two games this year. Um, Jackson Paolo, I think, is there as well. Corey Allen playing. Yep, uh, Corey again, Allen. And, and Junior Paolo, who's actually looks like he's going to be a player. Played for the Bears this season, was outstanding. He, he played pretty well on the weekend, I thought. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm by no means bagging. I, I just look at the class of, of the Melbourne side in comparison, and 
Uh, if the Roosters are to win, it'll be like last week. It'll be scrappy and all effort again and maybe by a point. Yep, I agree with you. I'm exactly on that train. I'm going to go the Storm as well mm. in a potentially really tight game. But I just think the Storm at home, I'm bouncing back off uh, their loss last week. Uh, the blow-up they would have got in video review oh. from Bellamy, I'm sure. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for yeah. that. Um, so I'm going to go the Storm as well. Let's go to the second game and only two games this weekend, mm. um, which is... Not great for us footy fans because we're sitting around all weekend thinking, what the hell are we going to watch? Yeah. <laughs> um, the second game sees the Warriors host the Knights at Go Media Stadium on Saturday at 4 o'clock, which is, you know, it's daytime. Mm. I guess the first half is pr- fully in daytime and the second half might be getting a little bit night. But just quickly before we duck in and, and get into this game, the daytime finals, how good is it to see finals footy in the day? I don't like it. You don't like it? No, I don't like it. Come on, people. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nighttime sit back. At, you got to understand, nah. I'm the chubby fan. Nah. So I want to sit there with my meat lover's pizza nah. at 7.35 kickoff. I've got my uh, the brownies set up for dessert, maybe even a thick shake if I'm treating myself. I, I don't, I don't want to do that at 4 o'clock. Nah. But why? Nah. nah. Mate, I'm a bit, I'm asleep at nine o'clock. Yeah, well, you're an old fart. <laughs> you know, mo- most of us are thriving. Us no. footy fans are thriving. It's the best time of the no. year. Families. Yeah, we want it. We want it in daytime, mate. Did you see the Warriors, uh, Warriors Penrith game last weekend? Yeah. How good is we want a day? No. Wait, we want a daytime grand don't final listen. too. NRL, if you're listening. No, don't listen. We want a daytime grand final. No, we, don't. we want. We Talk want it. Right. We want it in the. We want the. Family and the boys in the backyard. We, we want go. the kids running around in the pool. We want the barbecue on, the snags going, Wait, what the beers flowing. You? Here's the grand thing. final. Mate, in the you, day. You get a public holiday on grand final weekend the next day. If you can't stay up till 10 o'clock on the Sunday night, that's yeah. your own problem. I, I don't. I like to be I'm, in bed. I'm, early. I'm speaking for the fans here, Chad. I'm, all right? I'm spe- it's the fans. I'm speaking game. for the fans. We don't care about the players right now. <laughs> We're talking about and the, the fans. Players. You finish the game, you finish the grand final. If you kick yeah. off at 8 o'clock, exactly. Hey, by the time you get back to the hotel, it's midnight. You don't sleep for four days if you win a grand final. Oh. It doesn't matter. No. Wait, what, time, what time do you go to bed when you won with Cronulla? I didn't. Exactly. So it doesn't matter what time the game ends. You're going to party nah. regardless. Families, we want it in the day. Let's, let's have a vote. Comment below or comment anywhere you're watching this yeah. or drop a comment on, on yeah. either one of our socials yeah. and let us know. Should the NRL Grand Final be done in the day or should it be done at prime time in the night for the TV ads? That's all it is. It's about the money. It, it, it's, oh, my, I'm not even... Don't do the Johnny Manziel, but <laughs> that doesn't help your argument. Okay, um, we'll let you guys decide that, all right? Yeah. We're obviously pretty split on well, that. What happens if you're wrong? Are you going to back down? Um, no, I'll, I'll continue to push for yeah, daytime. Saying, that's yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. I, um, I'm, I'm a big daytime fan, but yeah. all right, let's get, let's get, let's get our heads back on. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, Warriors uh, versus Knights, yes. four o'clock at uh, Go Media Stadium in yep. Auckland. Uh, the Warriors are favourites for this one. Um, to me. Well, Sean Johnson's back, um, been named. Hopefully, I'm assuming he would have to pass a fitness test on that injured calf. Yep. Um, I think the 90-minute performance from the Knights and the travel is going to affect them. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it'll affect them. Uh, I think they're going to be knackered, and, and they've got a couple of outs too, so Jackson Hastings won't play. Adam Clune uh, will come in. Lockie Fitzgibbon is out. Dylan Lucas will play. Uh, Adam Clune, though, I don't know if you've... You've played against him. You probably have one, yep. one or two games. They, they talk behind the scenes about him just being the perfect feeling, almost like uh, Jack Cogger maybe for Penrith in that he won't play, overplay his hand and he'll try and do the same things Hastings does and maybe give early ball to his outside backs. I think he deserves a lot of credit, Adam Clune, yep. uh, for coming in the back end of the year. He hasn't played much first grade this year. He's a first grade quality player, Adam yep. Clune. He's got it all, got a short kicking game, um, very smart with his decision making, got a good long ball as well. Loves to play that uh, 71 option shape on the edge where his back row will drop under him, he'll show, the centre will run a lead, the fullback will be out the back, and if the winger shoots, he's got a good lofty pass over the top where he can hit the yep. winger. You have to feel for Jackson Hastings, don't you? But, you know, what, what, it's devastating just to, you know, play the whole year. Back end of the year, he's playing really well, and yep. then that ankle's just, you know, let him down again. He's been awesome, and I know I... I I'm signed up. You know, I'm vote one Jackson Hastings. I, I love what he's done at Newcastle this year. And you, you empathise. Again, it's, it's, 
it's a, a carry on effect from that um, broken um, bone he had last year, and it just hasn't come good. He's actually come out and said they're a little bit cryptic this week, but said there's a bit of stuff going on behind the scenes with that. I wouldn't be surprised if he has to have maybe a follow up clean out in the off season. Um, but fair play to him, he actually ruled himself out. Uh, he said, "Don't name me." He, they just there's no chance getting it right. Let the team prepare how they will play and. Uh, they'll miss him. I think they'll miss Lockie Fitzgibbon too. I yep. think Dylan Lucas is a good kid with a bright future, but um, Lockie's potentially played his last game for the Knights if they don't win this one. He's off to. Yep. I think he's off to be coached by Sam Burgess next year. Warrington, if, I, if I'm correct. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so he'll be there with Georgie Williams and a couple yep. others. So yep. yeah, he, he's been a pretty good servant at Newcastle. Yeah, I think you just mentioned props to Hastings for getting on the front foot, ruling himself out, yep. putting the team first. Yep. Um, you know, which, which, by the way, and, and I don't know Jackson particularly well. I've only had a little bit to do with him. I know he, he had a start to his career where he's a bit of a rat bag and, and whatever, and he's the first one to say that. I think stuff like that is probably a great sign that he is matured, he is grown up. And I know they love him in Newcastle, both the staff and the players. I think, you know, he'll still be giving it his all with his help this week, yep. helping the team prepare in whatever way he can. I'm pretty sure him and Kloon, uh, who are both from Illawarra, I think. Will, yeah, two great mates. Yeah, we'll, yep. um, we'll be working together, putting their minds and coming up yep. with a game plan to, to break down the Warriors. You mentioned Fitzgibbon, who has played some great footy uh, for the Knights. You, over you guys the, have had some good run-ins, you and Fitz. We all do, always yeah. do. Yeah. Uh, the Knights and I. Yeah. Uh, Fitzgibbon mainly, because he's the opposite back row. Yeah, he'll yeah. be running at me a lot. Yeah, and yeah. He doesn't take a step back. and It's one of my favourite battles. I always notice when it's Newcastle versus whether you're playing for the Cowboys or whoever, it's Fitz and Townsend. <laughs> it's Fitz and Townsend pushing going back and forth. I don't know what it is well, there. I, I don't know. There's not like a thing. We shake Did hands. Did you steal and his like, Maccas once? Nah, or? Well, it's just we, we shake yeah. hands and we yeah. you know get over it. It's yeah. just... Two competitors trying yeah. to compete. And okay. Maybe he likes nighttime grand finals and you like daytime ones. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is the big back rower and I'm the small halfback. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. He is, he's picking on me. Yeah, but um, sure. no, it's, it's all good. That's what footy's all about. Yeah. Um, wish him the best uh, with his uh, career over in the Super League. But I was just going to say uh, the play that the, the Knights have been running to hit Fitzgibbon, mm. which again they scored off the weekend, was they. they go to the line and they really isolate Fitzgibbon who will go into the half and almost turn his hip, yeah. run a little bit of an outline and get that right arm free and offload. And um, they scored another try on the weekend, but they'll miss they'll miss him on the weekend. Um, yeah, well, uh, there's that, that, and I think it's that play you're talking about. I haven't necessarily seen it often before where they go to him and it might be like a, a short crash ball and they've got three or four blokes out the back. And he, he does, he turns his whole body so his back is facing the trial line they're attacking and it's almost a, 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 like a netball pass that he, he gives on, which is obviously a, a planned thing, but it was not in his arsenal, I don't think, and, until this year. Yep, that's the play you're talking about. It is, um, I think it's just because it isolates, it puts a big man on the half and yep. you know that uh, Ponga and the centre are sort of swinging him out on the outside in support play, so it's like give him a chance to get an offload and make a play. and. Yep. Um, he's done a tremendous job. But I think that Dylan Lucas, he scored a try, was it two weeks ago? Yep. I think it was right foot, right foot, sharp right foot. I'm like, And then 4,000 cramps, yeah. 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 Uh, he's got something. Yeah, so they, um, and, and a while off to ever even dream of having the same career, but a similar path, they compare it to Luke Lewis. So Luke Lewis started on a wing way back in the day. Um, Dylan did the same thing. He's put on a bit of size, playing in the back row, been outstanding in cup, um, had the benefit of playing cup with your Adam Clunes, your Lockie Millers and, and things like that. I got massive wraps on him. He's he's re-signed, and with Lockie Fitz leaving next year, he's got a chance to, to earn himself a starting spot. And when he has played, he played in that game too against Brisbane, where I think Newcastle went down by two points right at the death. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's certainly something about him. He he won't let the side down this weekend. Yep, couldn't agree more. And I think just back on the the time of game, it's four. It says here four o'clock on NRL.com. Yeah. That may be two o'clock New Zealand time, so we're expecting. No, I think I think they did say six New, um, New Zealand time, so oh, it will right. be yeah the, the four o'clock kickoff for us in Australia. So you've corrected me there. So this is going to be a big clash. Obviously, it's do or die football. Loser goes home. Loser's season is over. Yeah. Um, the Warriors, as we spoke before, get Sean Johnson back. Um, their lineup looks really strong, really settled. Um, and I guess similar to the Knights with the team they've had, apart from the loss of Hastings, mm. which we understand and know uh, what a big loss he is for, for the Knights. 
Who do you see winning though? And I obviously, you know, I know what you're going to say, but uh, tell me, th- tell me your thoughts on how you think this game's going to go. I, I think we're going to see a lot of points scored. Uh, I think there's a bit of fatigue. Uh, I think these have been the two fairy tale sides, right? I think neutral fans of rugby league, uh, whose team might be out of the competition. I'd be shocked if they're not supporting either the Warriors or the Knights because they have been the two fall in love with stories. I agree. I'm obviously tipping Newcastle. Yep. But, you know, 25-24 uh, or something similar, I, I think it'll be close. There'll be tries scored. I think all eyes are on, I don't know the severity of Sean Johnson's calf niggle, but I have not seen many players have one week off from a, a calf injury or niggle. So if he plays, I don't know if he's going to be at 100%. Yeah, I think this is um, probably the biggest news this week prior to the game is the the health of Sean's calf. Yep. I think he'll probably be given right up to maybe captain's run or the day of the game even mm-hmm. to prove his fitness. But one thing you know with calves is if they're not 100%, like it is extremely hard to, to get through a game. And if you're in any doubt... Like, you've got to just pull the pin. And um, fingers crossed for Sean, he can get back in because we understand, we know the difference that, sh- that Sean can make. But I'm going to go with the, the Warriors this week. Yep. And I'm going to go uh, with them regardless if Sean is in or not. I just still think that their defence um, and what coach Andrew Webster has been able to instill in them, especially with their goal line defence, which we spoke about last week, I think is going to be too good. And I think the Warriors win this one 20 Four to six. Okay, hang on. Let's stop. You're saying if Sean Johnson doesn't play, they still win comfortably. Yes. They shut. They shut down Kalen Ponga and they win comfortably. Yes. How do they shut down Kalen Ponga? It's a, it, it's tough. Don't get me wrong. It yeah. is extremely tough. But the Knights. Let's not forget the Knights have just come off a 90 minute epic thriller. Yes. They've travelled across New Zealand. Um, they've had a big, big two months. A lot of momentum and a lot of things uh, going right for them. And, Unfortunately, this game, it's at some stage, it doesn't go right for you. Yep. And um, I just think the Warriors, yeah, with their home ground support, this game sold out, I'm pretty sure, within 30 minutes, yeah, which is apparently. just bravo to the, uh, the NZ uh, footy fans um, and the growth that the game's had over there this year. They've sold out so many um, games this season. But, yeah, I just think the Warriors can do it. I think, you know, you spoke about the two fairy tales. I think... You know, this fairy tale. I think the Warriors have almost been everyone's second team. The Knights potentially a third team, but I think mm. people always want to see an underdog win. And yeah, um, yeah the Knights for me, are, um, unfortunately, it ends this week. You reckon it ends this week? Okay. I mean, you obviously yeah, you can disagree with me. No, I, I respect your opinion, <laughs> except when it comes to grand final timings. I respect your opinion. Just want an explanation. And and look. I'm probably going to be wrong, and I'm thinking with my heart, but I just... Well, we don't know. The Newcastle fairy tale lives on. Okay, well, let's uh, finish the podcast now, Elliot. We've um, picked our winners for this week, and we've had a preview at week two of the finals. And like we did last week, we'll yep. just briefly touch on uh, the NFL. Yep. Obviously, we had a week one of the NFL happen at uh, Monday morning, yep. and you, your crazy cat, got up at 3 a.m. <laughs> that, that was that was a day. And, and a shout-out to you know people that actually work real jobs out there that get up at stupid o'clock and then have to go home and feed their families i was a shell of myself i got up at three to watch the bucks play by the way i told you so about baker mayfield he's back um and then by the time i got home that night same before i put a microwave meal and in, in i literally I put it out in the microwave i couldn't remember how a fork worked i just my brain was mashed potato it was a long day but how was um how was like it, christmas how was ab your co-host at triple m rush hour um was she holding it down for you monday afternoon on the show she or? normally does you know <laughs> what i mean yeah she carried it I, I can't tell you who we spoke to what we did what happened but i think she did most of it i was there in person in body uh, but not in spirit or mind so your bucks had a really good win obviously yeah. not many people would have picked that um uh, result on the yeah. on the weekend and my browns as well yeah. Let's go, Browns. Had a, a good win over Joe Burrow, mm. um, who limited their passing game to absolutely nothing. Uh, the defense was on fire. Yeah. I didn't get up at 3 a.m. 
I got up at 5 a.m. Which is poor, by the way. No, you're I in am your not off getting season. up. At, uh, you're in your off season. Get up and watch the game. I'm not getting up at 3 a.m. I'll Why? get up at 5 and I'll watch the back end of the game because three, I'll, mate, if I get up at 3, I'll just be walking around like you were. Go back like to it. bed. You just say, kids, you know, you got 12 got, kids at home. Tw- so we're all having a nap. <laughs> we are all napping at once. <laughs> they do nap at lunchtime. So yeah, this, this is someone that doesn't have children. This is how easy it is. Surely. I'll go in and nap yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but a few really, really surprising results yeah. um, on the weekend. The the um, Thursday night game, which saw the Lions beat the Chiefs that by one awesome. point. That was awesome. No one would have picked that. But yeah. Props to see the Lions doing well. It's the best. And, and this is the worst professional sporting franchise it has been in recent times. And, you, you, you know, if you're your league fan, uh, I'm not whacking the Tigers, but if you're a Tigers fan, think of what you've gone through the last few years. Times are by about 10. That's the Detroit Lions franchise. And all of a sudden, they're a good football team and they just beat the Super Bowl champions. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Great, great comparison. Um, let's have a look at a few other results. The yeah. Panthers, uh, oh, sorry, the Falcons beat the Panthers 24-10. Uh, the Ravens, um, what was a bit of a scrappy game, beat the Texans 25-9. to We spoke the Browns, beat the Bengals 24-3, pumped them. Um, Jaguars beat the Colts 31-21. to uh, Your Bucks beat the Vikings 20-17. to Saints beat the Titans 16-15. to What was a close one? Yeah. The 49ers, who uh, will go close to winning it this year, 30-7 to over the Steelers. I tipped the Steelers in the upset for the week. Too. I was just about to say that. Last week on this podcast, exclusively, Elliot Lovejoy, Triple M Rush Hour, right. co-anchor, yeah. tips the Steelers in what's going to be an upset. Um, sometimes we all get them wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes, sometimes we all get them wrong. And Did you, tip the Bucks to win. You got it ultimately yeah. very wrong. Yeah, uh, the, a bad one. the Commanders um, beat the Cardinals 2016. The Packers pumped the Bears again, 38 to 20. The Packers look like the real deal, don't they? Jordan Love. I think more the Bears look like a dumpster fire at this stage. <laughs> I, I don't know. When the Packers play a good team and beat them, I'll, I'll, I'll drink the Kool-Aid. But for now, I just think, same old Bears. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I just had memories of um, Aaron Rodgers just saying, I still own the Bears. I mean, he's yeah. not there and they still own them. Yeah. Um, Aaron Rodgers oh, just quickly. Man. That was, if you're a sporting fan over the weekend and on, you got genuine heartbreak because we saw Pappy go down on Friday, and then you, you, you're suited up to watch um, the Jets, you're suited up to watch Aaron Rodgers play his first game at MetLife Stadium. The crowd is bananas. He runs out there with the American flag. It's You're hyped. He plays four snaps and does his Achilles. It was heartbreaking. It was absolutely devastating. As a sports fan, um, I've watched Hard Knocks, which yeah. covers their preseason training camp. Um, you see all the ones Jets drive on YouTube. The build-up, uh, the big trade the Jets yep. make, um, the impact that he's had on their young receiving core. We saw Gibson yep. score that um, yeah. punt return from the touchdown and, and the way Rodgers uh, went into bat for him to make the team. It was just devastating. It felt wrong. You know what I mean? oh, and there must it be, still does. I don't know who did what in New York to hurt the football gods, but that city is cursed because the Giants stink again. They lost by, I think it was 40 to nil against mm, Dallas. Yeah. And then the Jets, you're like, finally, this team has sucked for a long time. Here's their chance. Here's the window. Their defense is great. They got some great players on offense. Aaron Rodgers is here. One of the, probably top five, top ten quarterback of all time. Yeah. Does want, he come back? Like, uh, an yeah, I think he does. I yeah, don't think okay. he wants to come. I don't think he wants to finish like that. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I mean, he nearly retired last year. He's so. 39, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we all know Brady played on until he's 45, I think. But um, I want to touch on the uh, – I saw a tweet from David Bakhtiari, which is yeah. the a Packers centre. Uh, for people who may not know, centre is the one who spikes the ball through his legs behind himself to the quarterback. Yeah. And he tweeted – who's very close mates with um, Aaron Rodgers. He tweeted – at NFL, um, can we please change the synthetic turf? And the, a lot of the players have been complaining over the, a number of years about the synthetic turf that the NFL used, and they want it just to be real grass, um, which potentially could have played a, a role in this um, this injury. Uh, did you see the the close up replay? And what did you make of, of what do you make of the turf? Yeah, well, I actually saw uh, as soon as the injury happened, I sent a tweet to the NRL physio. <laughs> Shout out to that guy because he I don't think he ever gets it wrong. Um, and he was speaking about his hatred for turf too. But stats wise, 
there are an incredible amount of serious injuries and knees, ankles, Achilles, all that compared to, to grass. But why would that be? Is that firmness? Is it? Yeah, it wouldn't have much give, I think. Okay. Where real turf has a bit of give. Yeah. Synthetic turf, not much give. And the thing that kind of concerns me at the moment is round one next year, there's four teams playing at Allegiant Stadium. That's right, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's synthetic, synthetic turf. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen with regards to them playing on synthetic turf or them changing it to grass, but I pray to God that they change it to grass for those boys. Because speaking to a couple of players um, in the English Super League, or Sam Tompkins, an old friend of mine, oh, yep. who's played over in the Super League for a long time, he's said that... He's up this year, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he's yeah. retiring yeah. at the end of the year. He said that there was one team, it might have been an old Wind, Widness Vikings or some team played on synthetic turf and they wouldn't dive to score tries. Right. And they just hated getting tackled because of the turf. So let's get a let's maybe get some clarity on that. What the boys are doing, those four yeah. teams. Hopefully it, it is turf. But it was devastating for us sports fans to see oh. Aaron Rodgers go down. Um, it's just robbed us all of so many that's, good moments. That's saying the ultimate move would be the Jets call Tom Brady yeah. and just say, "Come on, mate, you, you got sixteen weeks in you. I, I know you've retired twice, but come on, that, he could do it. He, mate, as much as we laugh." <laughs> he really could. He could. He really could. He could. Oh, geez. Let's see what happens. Uh, moving on, a couple more games. The Dolphins. Yep. What a game. 36 oh, 34 over the Chargers. That game went back and forth. But yep. Tua and um, Tyreek. Yep. What a combo. Yeah, Tua, Tunga by Lower, that a lot of people like to bag and say he doesn't have the arm strength, this out of the other. Threw for 400 and something yards. Tyreek Hill called the cheater because that's how fast he is. 200 and something yards receiving, I think. Uh, Tua, they always say, I'm him, I'm him. Tua is him. Yeah, he, yep. He'll be a contender for MVP this year. And, and Miami, are fun to watch. Yeah, they are fun to watch. That arm, that left arm, that long ball, that deep ball, oh. he got was just on point. And Tyreek was an absolute beast. The Eagles beat the Patriots 25-20. was a bit of a scrappy game. Yep. Um, see Tom Brady get um, put into the Patriots Hall of Fame, I think, and have a presentation, which was really cool to see. He did that, let's go, yeah, one I, last time. I, I didn't like seeing him back in a Pats jersey. I understand <laughs> it, but for me, he's a Buccaneer for life. Oh, I think he's a Patriot. But anyway, the Rams... Uh, Upset over the Seahawks. Yep. Didn't think that was going to happen, did we? No, but I also don't trust the Seahawks. Um, I think they overachieved last year with, with Geno Smith and not a lot of pieces there. Um, and the Rams, Sean McVay, just had them up from like Ricky Stewart last week. Yep. Hey, no one gives us a chance. Home two, the worst team in the league. The old Matt Stafford arrived. They were very good. Yep, yep. Couldn't agree more then. We touched on the, before the Cowboys pumped the Giants 40 0, and the Jets beat the Bills in overtime 22 16 with that uh, punt return touchdown by the rookie Xavier yep. Gibson. Um, what a play that was, mates. Wrap it up. Thanks again for coming on today. Always a pleasure, Chad. Appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, you guys, for watching and listening. Um, if you enjoyed the episode, please make sure you do subscribe, like, drop us a comment, and don't forget to enjoy in the conversation. Let us know what you think. Should the NRL Grand Final be in the daytime, like I think it should be, or in the nighttime, like Elliot should be? Because it's got to be daytime. Um, but you don't get an extra chance to sell it, mate. Just <laughs> put the okay. pole let, up and shut right. up. Yeah. Let the people decide. Yeah. But... Um, that's it for the today's episode, guys. We'll see you guys um, on the next episode. We'll jump back on again next week, preview uh, week three, which will be the qualifying finals to get into the grand final. Um, we'll have a look at this weekend's games as well. It's going to be a big weekend of footy, and um, we'll see you guys soon. Cheers.